Hi, and welcome to the When Women Fly podcast. Each episode, I have poignant conversations with women who fly, run, surf, ski, climb, or otherwise soar, and possess a passion for life that is infectious. These are honest and insightful conversations about dreams and reinvention, often in the face of uncertainty, doubt, or other impediments. We talk about busting paradigms, grit, working hard, and playing hard, all while building a community around the empowering metaphor of flight. I am your host, Sylvia Winter, a pilot, runner, mother, skier, list maker, and apparently podcaster. I believe that when we share our stories, own our fears, and dismantle our perceived limitations, the possibilities are boundless. Whether you're pursuing your passion or simply love the idea of possibility and wonder, this podcast is for you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Let's get started. My guest today is Shannon Huffman Paulson, a native Alaskan author, mom, consultant, and former Army Apache helicopter pilot. She is the author of a new book, The Grit Factor, Courage, Resilience, and Leadership in the Most Male-Dominated Organization in the World. She also founded the Grit Institute, where she coaches people on developing grit in careers and workplaces. We talk a lot about grit, what it is, how it is built, and what the soft underbelly looks like. We talk about resetting, refocusing, and deciding what you really want from life. It is a tactical and a motivating conversation. Shannon is honest, wholehearted, and willing to share many facets of her journey. We get under the hood and talk about Shannon's childhood in Alaska, the challenges and opportunities behind her military career, the tragic loss of her father and stepmother in the Arctic, and her first book, North of Hope, which chronicles her return to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, where she retraces her father's last trip and faces the honest life and death cycle in the wild. Beyond her time in the military, Shannon is an accomplished athlete, scholar, and adventurer. She has completed Ironman triathlons, climbed Mount McKinley in Alaska at age 19, jumped out of planes. She earned an MBA at Dartmouth and an MFA in creative nonfiction. We talk about faith and music and the role these play in her life. She speaks to me from her home in the Pacific Northwest, where she, her two sons, and her husband navigate this unusual winter of 2020-2021. Enjoy my conversation with Shannon. Shannon, welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's a complete honor to have the chance to talk to you today. Sylvia, it's great to join you. Thanks so much for having me. So to save myself from choosing how to describe what you do and what you have done, how do you like to be introduced? What a great question. It depends on where. I just had somebody ask me that for a capital campaign we're running for our local library. And I said, how about community member and board chair? <laughs> exactly. But no, I'm an author now and I'm a leadership speaker, a keynote speaker and leadership trainer for large organizations and corporations. And that's been a lot of fun. So I'm founder of the Grit Institute that really focuses on this whole leader training with a focus on grit and resilience. And writing and creating is very much a part and parcel of the work that I do as well. Hmm. Where were you born and how did the way you were raised play into what you're doing now, I should say? Yeah, I was born in Anchorage, Alaska. And my father had been sent there actually out of law school, drafted for Vietnam. Uh, but because he was a JAG attorney, for some reason, they sent him to Alaska instead. And he ended up deciding to stay. So I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. And I do think that, I mean, Alaska has you know, half a million people in it. I'm sure we're all quite different. But there is something that is adventure seeking and adventurous about growing up in Alaska, for sure. And I am Absolutely sure that that helped to form me into the person that I became and continue to become, I hope. You know, that's what, sort of why I sort of clunked into that question. As, as we'll get into talking about grit, you know, I have sort of this persistent question about the way we're raised and how yeah. to sort of forward engineer grit. How much of that just simply has to do with what happens between zero and 12 or whatever that impressionable time? So I think growing up in Alaska is probably a really great ingredient to to building grit. But I would love to talk about yeah. the grit the grit factor and your most recent book, The Grit Factor, with the subtitle Courage, Resilience, Leadership 
in the most male dominated organization in the world. So let's talk about the book. And let's talk first, how did you have a seed of an idea to start this book? Yeah, I'm so honored to have The Grit Factor out into the world uh, because it started about seven or eight years ago. There was a young woman who reached out to me and I had had the opportunity a number of years ago to be one of the first women to fly the Apache helicopter in the United States Army and led two flight platoons in a flight company on three different continents before transitioning through my MBA and then working in the corporate world as well. And so when this young lieutenant reached out to me, she was asking me to mentor her as she began that same journey of going to Fort Rucker and beginning flight school and beginning this aviation career. And I immediately said yes, but then thought, wow, it's been a number of years since I've been out of the army and worn the uniform. And surely my experience as one of the first women to fly the Apache was somewhat unique. And so I wondered how I could scale the information that I provided to her as she started her journey at a very different time and perhaps making different decisions along the way. And then also, if I did that work, which I knew would be significant, how could I scale the people to whom that information was available? And that was really the genesis of what became the grit factor. It was several years of interviewing leaders in the vanguards of their fields, their early women general officers, one of the first women on submarines, a combat rescue swimmer in the Coast Guard, one of the first women Army Rangers, aviators across three generations from World War II to the present. And just truly this incredible cohort of leaders who happen to be women, they happen to be military, and then synthesizing Mm -hmm. those stories into the lessons learned, which they shared so generously, and then looking at the supporting research as well in leadership and management and psychology and all of those things on grit and resilience that really help us to understand and inform the choices that we make and our own development. Hmm. It's such a um, sort of popular topic, grit, and It's defined in a couple different ways. How do you define grit? Yeah, I have always thought of grit. And it's, again, going back to childhood, not just being raised in Alaska, but also by my particular parents, right? I think I was certainly brought up to have grit. And we actually use that term. And I have all these stories that I could tell about (laughs) how we thought about it back then. But I have called it a dogged determination in the face of difficult circumstances. And I know Angela Duckworth, who is, of course, the premier researcher at University of Pennsylvania, has called this passion and perseverance towards very long-term goals. Mm -hmm. But I kind of like to think in this environment, especially when the long-term is so incredibly difficult to even imagine, much less see, the horizon is so obscured, um, that dogged determination really comes into play. Hmm. So just to dig deeper into the differences, dogged determination being different because... It's just a, there. there's something that is, it's not particularly elegant. Uh, there's just this determination and this commitment to keep on keeping on. Now, there's been some research and some discussion that really is anti-grit, I would say, in the last year or so, which mm-hmm. says, hey, instead of grit, we should be really focusing on systems change, or there's some times when it's time to move on. And all of those things are also true. But I think the answer is really a both and and not an either or. We need this resilience. We need this grit to be able to continue in the face of hardships, especially in this time that we're facing right now. And yes, there are also other decisions to make in terms of when it is time to move on to another opportunity or when it is time to really engage with systems change. But most likely it's a both and sort of an answer. Mm -hmm. And they're right. It's multifaceted. In a sense, um, the dissenters, the critique sort of plays on the narrow, the narrowness of the focus. But on the other hand, in order to make your point, you need to really drill down on what grit is. And so I think, I think that's comes with the territory. Yeah, for sure. And I I will say like, I don't presume to be a a, uh, social scientist at all, right? I'm more of a storyteller. And so really my hope in the grit factor and what I am so excited to be able to bring into this world is, is the stories and the lessons learned and then the research that supports those. Mm-hmm. And what that really helped me to understand was that grit wasn't this discrete ingredient the way that a scientist might consider it, but really more of an element of the fabric of our character. And I think that makes it a much more holistic sort of a conversation than mm-hmm. just simply looking at the uh, the nugget of, of what we might call or define grit. Yes. And I think the character aspect of it is, I think, what's been critiqued as being void in some of the other descriptions, right? Like, you know, what about integrity and kindliness and the other aspects of moral character that are essential for 
however you want to define success, right? It's those character ingredients are really essential. Absolutely. And you know, something that I really appreciate about Angela Duckworth's work is that she actually runs something that she calls the character lab, right? So she's also understanding it within the context of this larger piece. And I, I really think she's got just phenomenal content there. So I recommend everybody to to sign up for her emails as well. So with your experience growing up in Alaska, and then you went to college, and that was sort of a really big change for you. And I see yeah. that as a different time type of challenge that you opted into. But tell us about that phase in, in your life. Yeah, I think I was, uh, I don't know if it was a typical teenager, but I was certainly a teenager that wanted to get as far away from home as humanly possible. I was very ready to launch. So I ended up accepting at Duke University, which was on the other corner of the country, obviously. And I still think back on that transition of going from growing up in Anchorage, Alaska, and then going to college in North Carolina at Duke as the biggest culture change of my entire life, the biggest culture shock. It was completely different than any understood before. So that was certainly a huge, huge shift. There's no question. And how did you find your way through through Duke? I think part of it was actually ROTC and that gave me a foundation in an interesting way. I had not expected to join ROTC when I was at Duke, but I also knew that I was the eldest child, that finances were tight, that I needed to find ways to continue to pay for college. I was already working two jobs and and so I signed up, not on a lark, but sort of as an experiment, assuming that I wouldn't like it and that I would probably end up quitting, but at least I could say that I tried. Mm -hmm. And I ended up really connecting to this concept of something that was bigger than myself, the idea of service, which was very much how I was raised, that service was a critical part of how I show up in the world. And then the people that I had a chance to get to know in ROTC were just an amazing cohort of fellow cadets and students, as well as the people who were in charge, the cadre, who were the instructors for the program as well. So so I think that was really a grounding. I also sang in the chorale and the chamber choir, and I gave tours at the museum. So you find those things that are interesting to you that are part of who you are. And uh, and that, I think, helps to, to make that foundation possible. So it was really the precursor to your being in the Army and then becoming an Apache helicopter pilot. Yeah, but there was absolutely. there was a journey a journey between ROTC and um, becoming a helicopter pilot and Apache Apache helicopter pilot. So tell us some of the sort of the key inflection points in that in that journey. Yeah, I think um, I mean the story. I'll I'll get to the story that I I like to tell just because I think that was kind of the major inflection point. But just backing up a little bit, I think really getting to know the program and the people in the program, and again connecting to this concept of service became increasingly important over the time that I was uh, at Duke. And I didn't apply for a scholarship until my junior year. So it was a two-year guaranteed reserve forces duty scholarship with the assumption that I wanted to write, I wanted to do things you know, connected to writing. And so I would be a reserve forces officer. And so I started to drill with the National Guard. I drilled with the Guard for two years, the last two years of college. And then towards the end of my senior year, it's 1993, I drove out to Raleigh to the state aviation office to receive my assignment for the years ahead. And I report to this colonel, he's probably 20 years older than I am, sits behind this enormous desk with shiny windows up going up behind him. And and I remember saluting and trying not to shake too much. And I'm just, you know, I'm just a cadet. I'm just a college student. I haven't yet graduated or been commissioned. And I remember he asked me to sit down. And we exchanged a couple of pleasantries back and forth before he stopped in the middle of a sentence, looked down his nose at me and said, you realize, cadet, that you will never fly an attack aircraft. I'd never been told that before, you know, by anybody. And I guess mm -hmm. that's, um, that was fortunate that I grew up in a, in a pretty supportive environment that challenged me and, and challenged me, but also said, hey, you, if you work for it, you can do anything you want to do. And so I looked back at him and I was pretty, pretty pissed off, I would say, <laughs> uh, but, but I was, I was a college student and I was just a cadet. So I said, yes, sir, because I understood that there were times that you could only say yes, sir. And I drove back to the campus of Duke University and requested a transfer from the National Guard onto active duty. That was a pretty major inflection point for sure. That was a huge decision. My parents were absolutely, um, had nothing to say when I called. They were so surprised. <laughs> Were they so supportive? Yeah, they yeah, supportive. I think 
my father had, had of course served his four years. They were then divorced and, and remarried to, to other spouses. But he was very proud of his service. And so I think he was extremely surprised, probably worried as well, but, but was supportive as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And had you wanted to fly when you were younger? Yeah, when I was younger, I had, there's so much aviation, right? So much private aviation in Alaska. And so I'd certainly been around it and seen it, um, although it hadn't been a big part of our lives. But it was certainly an interest. It wasn't a passion, though. It wasn't something that I spent all my time paying attention to. So I don't want to misrepresent it that way. But it was certainly an interest. And, uh, and I also think that because I was serving in the Guard for the last two years of college, it was part of an aviation unit out of Raleigh, North Carolina, actually. And so I was around aviation for those last two years and figured if I had a, an obligation to pay off, I should do the most interesting thing I could do. And, and aviation was definitely it. So what was your experience learning to fly? Yeah, well, so after that experience with the colonel transferring to active duty, I had six months after graduation before I reported to flight school. And in that time, Congress changed the game on that colonel, lifted the combat exclusion clause, and suddenly every aircraft in the inventory was open to women and men to fly. So I thought that the sky was the limit. It was awesome. I mean, flight school is just an amazing time for sure. It's totally overwhelming. You're, you're drinking out of the fire hose, that, that metaphorical fire hose. Lots and lots of academics, lots and lots of flight time. I started on the Huey, transitioned into the OH-58 observation helicopter, which is the track for scout and attack. And I had requested and then ultimately was tracked into the AH-64A Apache helicopter. I graduated as an honor grad and earned, and earned that transition. So the flying was, was great. I, I just remember, though, going back to the very first part, and it's a story I don't tell very often, but learning to hover in a helicopter and it is like, it was 10 hours of just swinging this helicopter over this hundred yard kind of football field, being absolutely sure we were going to die at any moment. And then at some point, it just comes, you know, like at, literally they say it's finding the hover button. And at some point you realize you're hovering. Hmm. So yeah, I remember being terrified and being sure that I was going to be the one person who did not figure out how to hover and I was going to get kicked out. But everybody does the same thing. You go through. 10 hours of, of sheer terror and then you find the button and so there's a there's a moment when your coordination and your experience and repetition actually start click is that what the finding the button is i guess i mean it just yeah you just sort of realize at some point wow okay i'm hovering and it's been 10 hours of of really being in somewhat precarious positions <laughs> in the air yeah so yeah that was a pretty awesome feeling and and then of course you go into you know, the OH-58 from the Huey is even more, it's much more squirrely. It's, you know, your feet are constantly moving on the pedals. And then you go into the AH-64A and it's all hydraulic assist. I mean, you don't really have to do too much, right? Mm -hmm. It's all because it's really then becomes, it's it's a flying weapons platform. And so at the end of the day, it's really about learning the, the um, systems management inside the cockpit mm -hmm. and the flying is heavily assisted. So, but it's still a lot of fun. Can you share with us an experience um, when you were in combat that was impressionable? So I didn't technically fly in combat. I flew, uh, I was in the service for eight years, uh, not including the guard that was between the deserts, I like to say. Uh, so my deployments were to Bosnia and to Korea, and they were considered imminent danger, but not technically combat. And I just want to okay. clarify that for those who um, who are doing the, do, doing the real deal. But yeah, no, one of the, most impressionable missions that I can remember in Bosnia. And Bosnia was, I had taken my second platoon. It was in a, a battalion that was our sister battalion. So I'd been working in one battalion for two years. And then I took a platoon in our sister battalion, which had been selected to go to Bosnia. And our mission there in 1997 was the support of the Dayton Peace Accords. It was the NATO Stabilization Force. So technically, they were starting to hostilities had ceased in theory, but there was still an elevated threat level. But then the rules of engagement had really been severely tightened. And one of those rules of engagement was that helicopters could not fly below 300 feet, hmm. which probably sounds pretty low for any civilian, because if one flew over your house at 300 feet, you would certainly <laughs> you'd pay attention. Mm -hmm. But um, in a tactical area for a military helicopter, that's a pretty high elevation. And the problem with that is that then you are really, really easy prey to any kind of surface to air munitions, right? Whether it's a missile or an anti-aircraft gun. So we were flying one of the early missions 
in our deployment. And our job was to fly in teams of two to oversee weapon storage sites that the Serbs were required to maintain in accordance with the Dayton Peace Accord. So heavy weapon sites, that means that the navigation is really, really easy. We fly along the roads for the most part. We're flying at night. We're flying under infrared, under that monocle that covers our right eye. But the navigation and the infrared is beautiful because it's the Mediterranean. So it's hot during the day and it's cool at night. And mm. so I remember flying up at 300 feet to that weapon storage site, coming to a high out of ground effect hover. And out of ground effect means that the, ro- the vortices from the rotor blades are not supporting the weight of the helicopter. So it takes a lot mm. more power from the engines. And if something goes wrong, things are more difficult to recover from, both basically. So we're coming to this high out of ground effect hover right above this heavy weapon storage site. And all of a sudden, the sound in our helmets changed, changed, and it changed in a way that I had only ever experienced in the flight simulator, because we were being tracked by one of the most lethal anti-aircraft systems in the world. Now, my backseater and I both puckered up quite a bit. We weren't allowed to break that hard deck, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, what do you want me to do, LT? Do you want me to break the hard deck? And LT means lieutenant. And I said, no, you know, stand tight. And I called the controlling agency that was responsible for all of the aviation operations in sector and said, this is Blue Max 5-6, this is our position. We're at 300 feet. We're being tracked by the most lethal anti-aircraft system in the world. And we waited for the reply. The sound in our helmets changes again. And now we're not only being tracked by that radar, but we have been acquired by that system, which means that if they fire, we'll be killed. Wow. And just then the controlling agency comes back on the radio and says, if you're nervous, you can return to station, but don't break the hard deck. Wow. So I like to joke, yeah, nervous? Yeah, we were nervous, (laughs) for sure. Nervous. (laughs) If you're nervous, yeah. (laughs) Nervous. And I think about that in in, uh, that time a lot for a lot of different reasons. One is how quickly we had to make a decision, right? So in a very, very short amount of time, I had to make a decision. I knew that provocation was more likely than actual engagement. I knew that Mm -hmm. Nothing like this had happened in the previous six to 12 months. I knew that if we broke the hard deck and broke the rule of engagement, we'd be grounded and investigated. And I knew we hadn't completed the mission. Mm -hmm. So in that short amount of time, we made the decision to turn over and turn, reach over and turn down the volume on that radar tracking device. Mm -hmm. And that's how we flew the rest of the time in country. Wow. And I think about that a lot because it feels like I actually had one audience member in a smaller group once get almost angry at me and say, that's so, ir- I, how's that responsible? You know, how could you even think about doing something like that? And part of that is, is you're, you've gone through hours and hours of briefings, you understand the situation, you have a sense of the air, you have a sense of the theater and, and, and the requirements. But part of it too is, I, I mean, the willingness to be focused on the mission for sure. I end up using that example actually though a lot to say that there's so many inputs coming into all of our lives. And if you think Mm -hmm. of yourself as sitting in a cockpit and we're all in our own cockpits, right? And there are so many inputs coming in at any given time. There's Mm -hmm. phone calls and text messages and emails and conferences and Zoom calls and four-year-old soccer, little soccer game and aging parents at home, all those inputs. And if you're going to stay focused on the mission, you have to find some way to turn down the noise. Mm-hmm. And I really do like that metaphor for that particular purpose. I mean, the specifics of the mission are one thing that, that would mm-hmm. require a whole different explication. But, but that concept of really turning down the noise so that we can stay focused on what's important, I think, is really important. It's also interesting to me that when you made the call and the first question or command was, if you're nervous. so it's actually an emotion, right? It's not yeah. like if you're in this position or if you hear this or if this, but it's actually if you're nervous. So if you weren't in touch with an emotion amongst all of that chaos, which clearly was a really strong emotion, you know, it's interesting that in the end, it's like, well, if you're nervous, like get out of there, right? Right. Well, and I think, I mean, if I think back on that and I have to say like, this is so many years ago that I would not swear on the Bible that I've got that verbatim word for word, right? <laughs> so <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> I imagine that the controlling agency also had the same understanding that, you know what, this is going to, this is just provocation. We've seen yep. this happen, you know, 25 times in the last month, which I have not seen because I'm not the controlling agency. Right. And so we want our pilots to be safe, but we also don't feel like this is a big threat. I'm guessing that they had all of that perspective that I did not have mm-hmm. as controlling agencies should have. And that probably had helped to inform that, but 
So interesting. So much in that experience that I'm sure, gosh, really informed your approach to the grit factor and also drawing the stories of the other women that really make up the book and the findings. I'd love to go yeah. back to talking about the grit factor and in hearing some of your stories, it's an, sort of a nice segue to some of your core points. So if you could maybe walk through the, that, I'd, we'd really love that. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, and again, the grit factor is not just informed, but actually shaped by the stories and the lessons learned that were shared by these other incredible leaders. And that is really the strength of the book is that these these leaders were willing to share stories and lessons learned in a, such a candid and honest and vulnerable way that I think uh, oftentimes women don't share their stories as much. And I think we're conditioned almost not to. But the way that once I started to do the synthesis of these stories and these lessons learned and to see what came up most often, what was really the, the most substantial thing that I could pass on to a reader, it really broke out into three different sections. And those sections are commit, learn, and launch. Now, commit is really doing some deep internal work. I like to think of this now as a grit triad, right? Commit, learn, and launch as past, present, and future. So if you think of commit as your past, and commit is really owning your past, not just saying, yes, this happened, but saying, hey, th this is the raw material of my life, much of which I may or may not have chosen, but this is how I am going to shape that raw material to move me in the direction that I think I can best contribute in this world. And uh, I think mm -hmm. that is really both the opportunity and the responsibility that all of us have is to take that raw material and to shape it. So we talk about in the commit phase, in that owning your past is really owning your own story and then drilling down to core purpose. And core purpose becomes this anchor and this foundation for grit, for, for the grit that is part of all of us that we can continue to grow and develop, but is really part of, of what makes us up. The second phase is learn, and learn is connected to deep engagement in the present. And that's such a hard thing for us to do, right? Because we're constantly being jostled around by inputs and looking ahead, and, and it's very difficult, really, to, to ground ourselves in the present. But that ends up really being a focus on drawing your circle or building your team, because none of us do it alone. That came out very loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Really working on the art and science of active listening. And what I think, the reason I think this came out so often was so many of us that are so action oriented, at least speaking for myself, this is a really difficult skill to develop mm -hmm. when you're so have such a bias, strong bias for action, but also because going back to that draw, building your team, relationships matter and they matter a lot and, and none of us do it by ourselves. So that active listening is a key component to, to drawing that circle and building that team. Mm -hmm. And then finally is really building those skills of grit and resilience in that engagement in the present. And there are very specific exercises you can do. I pulled some from the Army's Master Resilience Training Program that's developed from the University of Pennsylvania's Positive Psychology. Uh, center, but also there, it we look at mindset as well. And I'm talking more and more about mindset because it's so critical. And that's not that's in part the work of Carol Dweck and the growth mindset idea, which has now been additional research has continued to build on and expand on that. But the other part is the idea that you also have to have this mindset of grounded optimism. And uh, and I talk about an anecdote that can lead us into that. But that's really critical as a base for grit. And then finally, we have launch. Launch is looking towards the future, grounded in the past, engaged in the present, and going forward with audacity, which means you're willing to face failure, you're willing to face fear, with authenticity, being true to who, our, who we are, because you can't sustain leadership in any way unless you are true to who you are, and then ultimately adaptability. And if there's anything this last year has taught all of us, it's how to be adaptable. But, but for sure, you could have every other characteristic, and if you're not adaptable, you're not going to make it as well. So adaptability almost ends up being kind of the um, mm. the keystone in a way of this concept of resilience and grit. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, the timing of the launch of your book is such a serendipity <laughs> and yeah. given, given that, you know, the, the requirement of us all to be so adaptive right now. Absolutely. Okay. So I actually want to go back to the commit part. Right. I because I want to really understand when you talk about owning your story and identifying your core values, why that's important, how we do that. There's always the saying, you know, show me what you do and I'll show you who you are. Right. So there's that that association, but indicating that you 
how you spend your time and what you're interested in is actually an, the indication of your value, not I have integrity. <laughs> oh, yes. you, know, you have to prove it, right? Because I, I frankly have done these exercises in groups where, you know, we sort of call out our common values. And, you know, it's so right. cliche, right? It's like right. trust and integrity and kindness. And it's like, oh, yeah, lovely. But right. what's behind that? So I'd love to know what techniques and the why behind that for the story and the core values aspect. Yeah, that is such a great point and great perspective. And I just led a, a um, group at a technology company actually through a month long journey, looking specifically at these areas, because these really are the areas where a leader, I think, has to focus before he or she is ready to move forward. And, you know, one of the examples and one of the exercises I give, and I give a, a number of them, and actually I came up with, with several more for this technology company that, that build on the grit factor even further but really is starting to look at your own life and looking at those inflection points in your lifeline and looking at what you learned at those inflection points. So this is, this is two, that's two different steps of the exercise, right? First is the lifeline with the major events of your life, whatever those might be, however you define major. The second part is going through and saying, okay, at these inflection points, what did I learn about myself? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's that you, you recognize the value. Maybe you recognize the strength. Maybe you recognize the weakness. Maybe you recognize that you really don't like sports or, you know, whatever it is that you learn. And then go back a third time and say, what does that represent in terms of values uh, for who you are? And then I think you start to assign values to those. So this is not starting at the values, but starting at the tangible. And I think that's a really, for me, that's very important to, to really be grounded in that tangible back to your concept of what you do is who you are, right? And I think mm -hmm. that can help to explicate a bit about how to think about who we really are and what really is important to us and what really isn't important to us. And then as you look at how you want to shape that lifeline going forward, trying to be sure that you are doing things and making decisions in concert with those other values that you've identified. And then the core purpose is a, is a separate exercise. And there's actually multiples on purpose that we could do. But and making sure that anything that you choose to do, because it really is, we have to choose where we spend our time, is aligned with those purpose and those values is very, very powerful. And it doesn't have to be something, you know, it's interesting because I did this same, this exercise, obviously, before I had written The Grit Factor. And I recognized, okay, I've spent a lot of time in the wilderness. You know, we did a lot of service projects like through our church growing up, like bringing food to people that needed it. And so service came out as this important piece. Obviously, service in the military comes into play. And then I realized, like, you know, I went up for my first book, North of Hope. I was in the Arctic in Alaska. And I ended up becoming very involved in Arctic environmental ad advocacy for some time. And I was like, where did that come from all of a sudden? I was like, mm -hmm. well, it's not all of a sudden. It comes out of having grown up and spending time in wilderness and connecting that to service, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's really weaving those together. And then there's incredible power and strength in that when you've done that work, I think. So starting with the tangible and then having that lead you to the place where it is that, that you can best contribute and you're most meant to contribute, I think is an incredibly powerful thing to be able to do. It really is an empowerful exercise and then a very insightful um, feedback, I think, to sort of you can feedback to yourself, right? And sort of. Yeah, for sure. And that, to your point, too, on your question, I think in the grit factor, the other important part to me was starting with story, making sure that there was research that substantiates, of course, the findings that these stories and these lessons learned suggest, but then also giving those tactical exercises to say, how do you internalize and make this your own? And so that's why each chapter then ends with some of those exercises, like the one that we just talked about, is really to allow the reader to bring that into their own lives. Mm -hmm. And you talk about building grit as a muscle. Can you speak to that? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I, I keynote to organizations across the country, right? And I get this the question almost every time, like, well, do you just have grit or not? Or can you build grit? And can I build grit? Or can my team build grit? Or can my kids build grit? And the answer is the science is all there, right? The science is really clear that you can build grit, that we all have it and that you can build it just like a muscle. And it's practice, right? It's like, so I spoke at West Point a couple of years ago and we talked about how you train for push-ups. You don't train for push-ups by going for a run. You train for push-ups by doing push-ups, right? Mm -hmm. So you train for hard things. You train for doing gritty things by doing hard things. 
And there's a, a lot more to it besides that, of course, like building up the mindset. And again, multiple exercises that I give from the Army's Master Resilience Training around this. But really, it is about training yourself in small increments, right? You take small steps towards bigger goals to do hard things. And then you're better and better able to do those hard things. And it seems to me like it speaks to the success of programs like Outward Bound and Knowles and and just simply the increasing desire for humans to do adrenaline sports and to do, to put themselves, ourselves in yes. challenging positions as if we sort of are self-correcting for the softness that our convenient world has gifted us. I don't know what the word for, but. Yeah, that's such an interesting idea. Yeah, that self-correction. I like that. But it does, it trains you and not just in that sphere, right? So if you train for adventure racing, you can draw on that strength in your story, right? And this goes back to anything that you've, you've gone through in their past. You can draw from that strength to apply it to whatever the challenges that you're facing now, like what all of us are facing today as an example. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, just, to, you know, I am curious. I'm sure you've given so much thought to how your book and the messages in your book overlap with this moment we are in now. And gosh, it hits home, right? It's like we're in this extremely challenging, extremely uncertain. How is it possible to strengthen even during a pandemic? Or is this exactly what we need? But it sort of feels a little awkward saying that. Yeah, I don't know if I would personally go that far, but I would, in terms of it being what we need, but I will say that it is going through a hard thing, right? And so I think having that mindset that what you are enduring right now, what we are enduring right now, what feels untenable sometimes is in fact making you stronger, especially if you can recognize that and say, how can I use this to help make me stronger as mm -hmm. one example? But I will say the second thing is because the grit factor, the one thing that it didn't anticipate in something like a pandemic, a global pandemic, is that I think the other thing that's important to realize, and I'm telling every group that I talk to right now this because I think we all need to hear it, is that grit is very important, right? It might be the most critical ingredient for success. It is also not a sustainable operating mode. It's sort of like being at, you know, 100 RPMs all the time. That's not a good way for an engine to run. And so I think it's important to recognize, and I don't talk about this in the grit factor, but I do hope listeners and, and others will take that into account, is that you've got to take care of yourself. You've got to go back. You can't defer the maintenance all the time, right, on the aircraft or else the aircraft falls apart. And we're the same way. We've got to take care of ourselves and make the space to be able to do that, whatever that means for us. And at the same time, say, hey, celebrate the small wins in the areas that you're working on right now. Look forward to something like two years in the future. That, mm -hmm. that sounds pretty realistic to be two years in the future. And then those are other ways that we build our grit and we build our resilience without having to say, hey, I'm, you know, things are hard. Let me see if I can make them harder. <laughs> Just know that they're hard mm -hmm. and you're getting better for it. Right. And that there is an end in sight. So it's up to you to decide how it is that you want to use this hard time once that end comes. If we can use this hard time to reset, refocus, decide what's really important, then that's, you know, in a nutshell, that could be a good thing. Yeah. In the long term. And if you're not in the headspace to do it right now, that's totally okay. Then just get through it and know that, hey, I'm going to go back and I'm going to figure out how to think about that in a way that is really productive. And in the meantime, what do I need to cut out of my life or trim off to be able to stay focused and, and take care of myself and my family? And I think that's a great way to kind of get through each day right now. So Yeah, because, you know, I think a lot about how when sort of this ferocious determination has a backlash, right? That moment when, I mean, it's, I suppose it's a matter of dosage, right? Too much, not a good thing, not enough, equally a poor outcome. Yes. Kind of like goes back to Goldilocks, just right, right? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> but how do we get there, right? And how do we, we probably sort of oscillate that line. And I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think each person is going to have a different experience with that. So you'll have to decide how it is to make it work for you. But I do think understanding the science that when you are going through challenging times, it can make you better if you decide that it's going to make you better. So allow yourself mm -hmm. to recognize that and celebrate that and then give yourself a little bit of a break. I think the other thing that is really helpful is just structuring time within this time, right? Whether it's Advent to the Christmas season or whether it's you know winter and giving yourself some structures that you kind of operate within 
allows you to mark time that otherwise is really difficult to mark. And that's a really important thing to be able to do as well, just to be able to get through the challenges of today. Yeah, it's a really good point. Measuring time, finding ways to have benchmarks. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Make your weekends different from your weekdays, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> have some variation. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good message. I'll my my kids are a little bit sick of the same old toast for breakfast. So yeah, maybe we'll shake it up a little bit, right? Yeah, on, on the weekends only though, right? Weekends only, then you have this differentiation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, right, right. You don't want to have pancakes on Monday. Oh, what a disaster! Exactly. I mean, we do. Maybe that's the point. <laughs> this topic of post traumatic growth has come up in an, in another episode, and I'm curious your take on it. You know, there's this idea. This concept de- developed by Tadeshi and Calhoun mm-hmm. from the Boulder Crest Institute about post-traumatic growth in which sort of this idea, and I think the the research they had done was on military members, if I remember correctly, out of the University of oh, okay. North Carolina and Charlotte. And basically the, what they are saying is that post-traumatic growth as a very positive thing is marked by people who develop a new appreciation of life after the trauma and newfound personal strength, or they see an improvement in relationships or new possibilities and sort of this spiritual change, right? Right. I'm wondering if you ever came across that research or how post-traumatic growth, which can be this incredibly positive thing, how that relates to your work or just your perspective. Yeah. And I'm not deeply familiar with the research. I'm aware of it, but I'm not deeply familiar with it. I guess what I would say is the the research that actually that I've been reading most recently is on on the POWs in Vietnam and both how they were able to endure the challenge and then how they were able to successfully reintegrate afterwards and and reclaim their their life. And what comes out of three different studies, and I think this is is likely going to seg very closely with with the work on post-traumatic growth, it was the attitude of optimism. It's the mindset of optimism. And again, not not Pollyannish in any way. It's this grounded optimism, this measured optimism that never, ever loses faith in the end, as Admiral Stockdale said, which you can never afford to lose, but also is willing to confront the realities of the present, however brutal they might be. And so that was really the determinant that came out of these three different studies of POWs, of the success of this unbelievably traumatic experience and their ability to uh, to be whole afterwards, as was that mindset. So I think We do have this incredible opportunity to say that whatever happens to us, again, you don't get to choose that raw material, but you can choose how it is that it's going to affect you or impact you. Mm. And that is our choice. I mean, our choice is how to react to what we're given. And, you know, Viktor Frankl's A Man's Search for Meaning might be the best book on this ever written. Mm. Certainly well well worth uh, spending some, some good time in. But I will say my experience on this, personally, is probably less on the grit factor, more on my first book, North of Hope, which was followed a family tragedy. And, and it was a very, you know, I took this trip to the Arctic a year after my father and stepmother had been killed by a grizzly bear and followed their footsteps through down the river along the same journey that they had taken. I really had a very structured approach out of necessity, because I just couldn't operate in any other way out uh, after they died. And I it was to, you know, to to sing the Mozart Requiem with the Seattle Symphony, to take the same trip, to join a grief group, and and to take these steps that I knew could be healing, and to try to find my way through that, and and to make sense out of it, and and to use the material honestly, but also to make something beautiful out of that at the end, mm-hmm. and and I hope that North of Hope was was successful at that, but I do think that all comes back to our decision that we make mm-hmm. each day, the commitment that we make each day to that mindset that whatever might happen, and maybe not in the exact moment of it happening, right? But mm-hmm. in the long run, whatever you're given, you can make something beautiful out of. And maybe that's really what life is all about. Mm, gosh, I'm so glad you brought up North of Hope. I think I wish these books, I wish the Grit Factor and the North of Hope were just a coupled, a requirement coupled, because you know I think some of the criticism of Grit is something you mentioned before, but sort of this bias towards action and and sort of doing it yourself and something that's very unsustainable, right? And right. what I think it lacks is, what it, what it has is sort of the strength of independence and yes. um, the sort of the muscle of having this determination to do the thing 
but it doesn't focus on the character, which we talked about, but also interdependence, right? And sort of seeing yourself in this web and North of Hope goes, you go there, right? You go into the soft underbelly, right? Of the underside of this uh, clearly very, you know, strong and accomplished human who um, knows how to exhibit every sort of grit but you know you're faced in a moment of tragedy and gosh you know how do you have that soft underbelly and how did the blinds you sort of get rid of the blind spots that you know you could easily put armor around yourself but you choose you make that choice to really dig into that experience I mean I cannot imagine going back following the footsteps of your father and stepmother in the case of of the trip to the Arctic, like literally the same river, the hula hula, right? The same campsite, such extreme courage of all the things in your life. I have to say that one just really makes me, impresses me in in a way that I can hardly even put words to. So thank you for both of these books. And I just want to encourage everybody to just gobble up both The Grit Factor and North of Hope because it, they're both, they're so rewarding. So there, hopefully Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, about the, you know, the, the Grit Factor is your current book, but, you know, what excites you about the future of The Grit Factor and your speaking in 2021? Yeah, you know, I am continually humbled by the opportunity to share this with audiences now through virtual keynotes, of course, and through this virtual training modality that we have. I hope that we'll come back in person. But I am also really incredibly grateful to hear from people how much it's important to them, especially right now. I mean, but it's important to them at any point. And, you know, some of these are technology companies that are struggling with diversity challenges or how it is that they can they can increase diversity, but also, of course, inclusion. Mm-hmm. Part of it is really about how it is that we find that strength in ourselves when we don't think that we have it. And I think all of us run into that, especially in the last year. But but honestly, at any point when when things either get tedious or they get hard or there's a major change or an obstacle that, that comes up. So I'm really grateful that that has had such an impact on so many people's lives. And I am hopeful to continue to share that as widely as possible. And hopefully that just helps to give us all courage. I think we, we get courage by sharing our stories. And what I think the grit factor does is takes those stories and says, okay, here's the practical application. Here's how you can make this work for you. And, uh, and that's pretty powerful. So. Yeah, it is pretty powerful. Yeah. What types of businesses do you, companies do you work with when you speak? You know, I literally have spoken, I think, to every kind of company you can imagine. I mean, at the, at the meat industry and the Produce Marketing Association to Microsoft and Intuit to the Ameriprise Financial Services to the WNBA. I mean, literally just about anything you can imagine. Restaurant, you know, In-N-Out Burger. So truly mm. any kind of an industry. And the, what's so great about it is that this, this message is critical for all of us, no matter what the industry, no matter what the level, right? I've spoken to a C-suite at a pharmaceutical company, and then to a sales team at another pharmaceutical company. So from the sales team up to the C-suite, these are really important messages. And it really is a treat to have a chance to share them and see people that are energized with with the courage that comes from it. Yeah. And that are really interested in improving, you know, their, their approaches to, to things. And you're not satisfied with the, the status quo, which takes a lot of humility, for sure. Yeah. It does, actually. That's a great way to put it. Yes, it sure does. That's right. And from the perspective of women, of females in male-dominated fields, organizations, industries, how do you see that changing? I think there's a couple of things. One is continuing to encourage women in those fields. The other is to encourage men to be allies as well. And there's some really uh, great work right now out. Uh, A couple of guys who have written their second book now called Good Guys that looks specifically at male allyship. And it's interesting, a podcast I was just on recently that focused on the military said, what do we need to tell these, these women leaders? I said, well, it's not actually the women that you need to talk to. It's actually the guys. And this is an ecosystem sort of a thing. But not only that, the real change, honestly, has got to come from the people who have the power. And mm-hmm. so I think that's the shift that we need to make is starting to understand this is, a, this is not just for the women's groups, right? This is for all of us. And until it is all of us, it's not going to change. 
And so I hope we can start to continue to shift the conversation to recognize that. That's really where change happens is when it is everybody taking that responsibility themselves. Mm -hmm. And do you see, you know, we've talked before about parenting and yeah. the, the grit of parenting. You know, Angela Duckworth has this interesting quote, which to summarize basically says that parents need to be grittier to have grittier kids, <laughs> which I love, right? Yes. And do you feel like this experience will, uh, this experience of COVID and 2020, do you think that, that it will profoundly affect our children? If there are there things that, and are there things that we can do or not do to, to leverage that during this time? I, this may or may not be a popular opinion. Um, in fact, it's not popular because I keep seeing all the articles that are contradicting it. I think the kids are going to be fine. Kids are resilient. And mm -hmm. if you as parents show resilience, here's where I'm right with Angela on this one. If you show resilience, like this is how we get through a tough time, they are going mm -hmm. to learn from you that this is how you get through a tough time. Of course, they'll never forget it. And that's a good thing, right? We'll say, hey, I remember when we had to wear masks for two years and for three years or however long it's going to be. They're going to be fine. Kids are tough. And I think the key is for us as parents to kind of step up and be a little tougher, <laughs> both in how we present ourselves and, and the example we show, but also in how we teach them how we teach the kids to be resilient mm -hmm. and how you teach them about the common good, right? Like mm -hmm. we say, hey, you might be able to have two kids over for a sledding party for your birthday. I know you're, you're turning 11 and you should have 11 kids at the ice rink, but that's not how it works because we're in a pandemic and there's something called the common good and we all work for that. And I, I think our society could use a little reminder of common good once in a while. So Yeah. And, and sort of the, the school of hard knocks, right? It's, you know, once you accept, accept that, the kids are like, oh, okay. It's everyone this year, all the kids, all of us, right, have had a COVID birthday by the time this is over, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Right. No, they're going to be fine. They're going to be fine and they're going to be tougher for it. And I think that's just fine. So now having said that, I want to just caveat that with that. I'm very lucky I live in a small community in the mountains and we get outside all the time. I know yeah. in New York City would probably be a lot tougher, but you know what? They're still going to be okay. So mm -hmm. part of that is the mindset as well. And I think we all need to have that mindset. We're going to be okay. How do we make the most of it? Let's get through it. And there is an end in sight. Yeah. I guess we already started to get under the hood a little bit, but I just wanted to ask you about the role of music in your life. Yeah. Uh, music is a huge part of my life and always has been a huge part. My dad sang in the Anchorage Opera. My mom played the organ at church. I've had to play piano, which I hated half of the time until my parents got divorced when I was 13 or 14. <laughs> But I will say it gave me this incredible bass. I also played flute and clarinet and cello. And to be able to then go on and sing in semi-professional choirs, I sang in the Corral and Chamber Choir at Duke and then sang, you know, Seattle Pro Musica was my most recent group. But everywhere I went with the army, that was not some tiny little bass, I sang with the local choir. And that was this incredible gift. But, um, but more than that, I mean, music is soul, right? Music is spirit. It's something that I am wrestling through making sure my kids are doing which is really hard mm -hmm. <laughs> all parents who do music with their kids know that I, I just can't imagine life without music it's been part of both exhilaration and part of pain and part of healing in a very visceral and important and spiritual way that I just I, I truly can't imagine my life without it mm, it's a really neat dimension of just sort of your whole your whole story and I mean, you're being hum humble because I know you're very accomplished at, at all of those things. And you, you've, you've played with Itzhak Perlman and just some wonderful things. So, Well, I used to say that everywhere I went with the Army, I would look for a gym, a church, and a choir. Those are my first three priorities. <laughs> a gym, a church, and a choir. So Episcopal Church, I found the Episcopal Church, found the choir, found the gym when I was good. <laughs> so. It's good to know some of your basic needs, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, gosh. Well, I think we're going to have to wrap up a little bit. So I have a few more just sort of general questions. Yeah. This is a podcast where we celebrate the spirit of taking on challenges and reaching beyond predetermined heights. It's about passion and pursuing that passion. So what's been the most useful advice that you've been given along your journey? I don't know if it's advice that I've been given or advice that I sort of interpolated, but I will say that one of the most important things is not to listen to the naysayers. And that's mm. so hard to do because when you really push beyond the boundaries, I mean, my most recent project is, is getting this local library built and funded, right? And there are so many people who will find ways to tear you down for that. 
I mean, there's so many people that are excited too, right? But it's really mm-hmm. hard because those really negative voices are tough. And uh, mm-hmm. especially maybe as women, I don't know. But I think not listening to the naysayers and staying focused on the goal almost to a fault is mm-hmm. how how you get to those new heights and how you are able to take on those challenges. And you've just got to totally stay focused on the goal. Hmm. And what advice would you give your younger self? Not to listen to the naysayers. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think I did a pretty good job of that, but I will say that I have spent way too much time worrying about that in my life up to the present time. You know, like, yeah. I think it's just a really hard thing to get past. And because you, you, you want to get along with folks and you want to be liked. And, but yeah, not to listen to the naysayers. And I would also say to be gentle with myself, to be more gentle with myself. That's something I wouldn't have been able to say until even like five years ago, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, give yourself a break once in a while and give yourself a little credit once in a while. Don't be too critical. And how do you navigate social media? Well, I just canceled my Facebook account. I just decided it was not very life affirming and I don't know that it sells books. So it certainly isn't a B2B sort of a thing. I have Instagram at the moment, although I'm thinking of canceling that. I want to be a lot more thoughtful about it, I guess, in the sense of understanding what's important from the business perspective. I think LinkedIn is important and possibly Twitter. Instagram is sort of just fun, but I don't really spend too much time on it. So maybe it's okay, but it's still owned by Facebook, which is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I have been on, I've used it a lot and I think it's been very helpful at various points, but I also find it to be huge, a huge detriment from the time perspective. And I just can't, I kind of can't afford that time suck or that distraction anymore. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough time in life. And so I'm trying to figure out what's necessary for business. I'm sort of starting to settle in on LinkedIn and Twitter. I love it. Just cut out the... Just cut. You know, I haven't missed it, Sylvia, at all. I mean, I know that there's some information that I'm not getting, but I can find it somewhere else. That's just a habit thing. I don't miss it. It's not, it's, it doesn't add, you know, it really doesn't. So... Right. And it sounds like, you know, finding the use for it as a tool, right? Which it yes. is an incredible tool, right? For many things, but it needs to serve you, right? Not you, it. Exactly. And I think we all have to be aware of the research. I know that we're not, we're not better than that research and that it's been pretty devastating to our society, I think, as a whole. I, I highly recommend everyone watch The Great Hack as well as, what is it? The, the social social dilemma. Yeah, social dilemma. And I, that was very helpful for me to, to see that and just say, you know, this is not being part of this, I think, is taking away from our society. And I don't really want to be part of that. So, yep. What are you reading? I know you're a huge reader. I'd love to hear what you're reading. Well, I'm reading whatever I'm reading my kids. So that's there's, there's always that. The Heartwood Hotel is the seven year old's current favorite, a series of four. I'm reading Red and Black, which is an old Stendhal novel. It's an old French novel just because. And by the way, I've been reading this for like a month. It's taking me forever. So I just read it in small increments. And then we're reading uh, The Way of Love for our Episcopal Fellowships book club right now, which is the book by Presiding Bishop Curry, which I also recommend because everything about him is wonderful. Mm. And so those are the, yeah, that's the primary thing. I've also been reading Auden right now because I'm going back and reading the, um, reading everything he's written around Christmas. And so it's been really fun to revisit some Auden. And, uh, and some essays and criticism around Auden as well. So, Oh, Shannon, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. I feel like it's, I am full of all sorts of thoughts of <laughs> core values <laughs> and grit and <laughs> um, oh gosh, uh, music. But just thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your books and just good luck spreading your word and your energy. Well, it's so great to talk with you, Sylvia. You uh, you do an amazing job spreading great energy yourself, and it's wonderful to be a part of this. So thank you. Thank you for listening to the When Women Fly podcast. My hope is that you leave this conversation with a sense of curiosity and empowerment to hold on to what is important and let go to what weighs you down. Stare fear in the face. If you like this episode of the When Women Fly podcast, Be sure to share and subscribe and let us know what you think. We love feedback. Be brave, be bold, and fly. See you next time.